So I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and so I'd, let me just tell you a few things about that first. Uh, PNNL is one of the 10 multi-program national laboratories run by the Department of Energy. We're located in Tri-Cities uh, here in Washington State, a couple hours from here. Uh, we're about 4,800 people that work in various research areas, everywhere from basic science through very applied work. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is fairly applied, and I, but I'm going to talk about some of the physics aspects of uh, this research. And, uh, but I'll just mention that the other half of my time I spend doing basic science, uh, working on uh, previously solar neutrinos and now on neutrino mass measurements through neutrinoless double beta decay. So if anybody wants to ask questions about neutrinoless double beta decay, we can talk about that after this talk. So. I'm going to talk about detection of nuclear threats at borders. And I'm going to give you the motivation for this and uh, what we are doing at the lab and the country in general in this area. So I'm going to talk about what are the threats and the potential impacts of those threats. Uh, what is radiation detection? Uh, the, inter the interdiction problem that we have, uh, some physics issues, and then some solutions to those physics issues. So the obvious threat is the possibility of a weapon of mass destruction coming into the country somehow and causing a huge amount of damage. Uh, the damage would be not only local, but it would be international. It would probably throw the world economy in, uh, into a total tailspin. Uh, in addition to weapons of mass destruction, we're, we're interested in what are called improvised nuclear devices. These are uh, nuclear bombs that are you know, made by somebody in their back room. Uh, we're interested in special nuclear material, that is the plutonium or uranium that could be used for making such a weapon, and also the possibility of radiation dispersal devices. A radiation dispersal device is just a conventional explosive that disperses radioactivity over some, some area and uh, thereby disrupts uh, the region. It, it, we often refer to these as weapons of mass disruption simply because they cause a lot of problems without necessarily a huge impact on, on people uh, in terms of health effects directly. Let me remind you that uh, just for scale, it takes four kilograms of plutonium, 239, or 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium to make a nuclear explosive device. So that's the scale, you know, it's like that, not very big. So I want to talk about some incidents. Uh, I'm not going to run through all these, I'll just touch on some highlights. First, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IEA, is a associated agency of the United Nations that oversees nuclear energy throughout the world. And in particular, uh, it watches for problems related to nonproliferation, uh, that is the spreading of, of nuclear technology in ways that uh, w you know, are undesirable. Uh, the IEA reported 18 incidents between 1993 and 2004 uh, that related to uh, movements of nuclear material that, it, that were of concern. Uh, in 1987, there was an accident in Guyana, and I'm going to talk about this accident, not that it was a terrorist event, but rather it gives an, a very good example of what could happen if there were an RDD, a radiation dispersal device, <coughs> utilized somewhere. Um, in 1994, police in Munich, uh, at the Munich airport, intercept a, a, a suitcase with half a kilogram of nuclear fuel material. Uh, in Prague, uh, they seized 2.7 kilograms of highly enriched uranium from a Russian worker. Um, in 1994, it's interesting, the, the, what's been referred to as the Radioactive Boy Scout. Uh, this, this Boy Scout here in the U.S. decided he was going to breed some material. So he got some uh, americium sources out of smoke detectors. He got some beryllium from somewhere. Uh, he got some thorium out of lantern mantles. And he bred uranium-233 which is, an, is a material that could be used for a nuclear weapon. You know, he did it for fun, but it was of concern that one can that easily produce material. Uh, in 1995, Chechen rebels planted a cesium source in a park uh, in Moscow and notified a TV crew. And then in 1998, they repeated that, but this time they had explosives on that source. So it was a potential RDD. And uh, Russian Customs in 2004 had reported over 200 attempts to smuggle one way or another various types of radioactive material. So there have been incidents. This is what drives the concern. 
that uh, there is trafficking in materials, and we're worried about that. Uh, finally, I might mention the Litvin Litvininko poisoning by pol polonium-210. You probably heard about this. This was the, the guy who was knocked off by some colleague um, in, in London. What's important about that event, and what you may not realize, is there were as many as 10,000 people who were contaminated by that source. It was a 100 millicurie source of polonium, which is a pretty good sized source. And it was spread all over the world. There were 52 countries around the world where contamination was found associated with that event. Litvininko died, he's the only one who died, but there were others that were medically impacted by that. So it is, that is an example of a terrorist event. Um, let me talk about Guyana. In Guyana, Brazil, there was a cesium-137 medical source. It was a source used for medical therapy that was left at an abandoned clinic. They, they went broke and they left it in an abandoned clinic. Uh, it was broken into and stolen. And it showed up in a junkyard. And uh, the owner of the junkyard opened up the container. And cesium uh, oxide is a powder. It's a, a, like talcum powder. It spreads very easily. So children started playing with this. It glows in the dark. It's great. You know, they painted their faces with it and they spread it around. Um, not realizing this, this is a huge source. 1,400 curies is a lot of activity. You know, this is the sort of source. This would be fatal in a few hours if you stood next to it. Um, so it took 11 days before this was discovered. And by that time, it had spread 100 miles. Um, four people died. The, uh, one of the, the daughters of the junkyard owner, the junkyard owner's wife, one of the workers, the junkyard owner survived but suffered bad burns. Um, so anyway, four people died and they received fatal doses of radiation, 400 to 600 rem of radiation. Um, 28 other people suffered burns of various uh, types and 249 people were contaminated and, and decontaminated. I present this not, you know, again, not as a terrorist event, but this is an accident that occurred uh, which is similar to what could happen around a radiation dispersal device because more than 100,000 people sought medical advice. So imagine one incident in one little town, 100,000 people show up to get medical advice. That's what could happen associated with an RDD, a tremendous concern by the population that they'd been impacted, even though a small number of people really were. And it cost $20 million to clean up. And what you see here um, is a radiation burn on the skin. And these are packing crates and cement coffins that contain all the dirt and houses and things that were knocked down as a result of decontamination of this event. So it's an interesting example. Another example is um, there was a large strontium-90 source found in Russia. This is from what's called a radiothermal generator. A radiothermal generator looks something like this. Uh, if you take a uh, material like strontium-90 and embed it, uh, you can ge thermally generate electricity. So these are used extensively in the Soviet Union to light things like lighthouses, very remote locations. They'll run for years without upkeep. Well, somebody stole one of these things, broke it open, and this is the source. And it just happened that um, some woodsmen, four woodsmen found this, or three woodsmen, found this in the forest, and it was warm. It heated them, so they sat around it all night. They all got severe burns, uh, and uh, at least one of them died as a result of that exposure. Who knows how it got there? But again, it's, it is possible to steal such sources and uh, to cause problems because of them. These are some examples in the United States. This is a well logging rig. Sources are used for well logging. That is, you drop them down into a well and give off gamma rays and neutrons and look for the radiation that comes back into a detector. And that helps you locate where water is and where oil is in a well. Okay, so that's called well logging. Well, these are well logging sources here. And um, these are some old well logging sources. And here you see some well logging sources that were stuck underneath a cow bucket in the middle of a field, unattended. You know, anybody could come along and steal that sort of thing. There are literally thousands of these things scattered around the country and around the world that are potential dangerous sources. Uh, other examples, industrial radiography sources, these things. Again, you know, we're talking about they, you could get a fatal dose within hours of standing next to one of these things. 
Um, they're used routinely for all sorts of industrial applications. Obviously, the biggest concern is a full-up nuclear weapon. These are Soviet weapons, and I'm not exactly worried about the, the megaton device, the big one, but this little artillery shell right there is an artillery shell. It's a nuclear weapon. It's about the same capability as the Hiroshima bomb, and it could be carried around in somebody's backpack. It'd be heavy, but I mean, it could be carried around. So it's that type of thing that we're concerned about. Another thing to realize is that our ports of entry, our whole system of commerce, was never designed for security. I mean, they, they don't want you to walk off with a container. But aside from that, you know, we didn't design these things to look at for terrorist type events. So that's a, that's a problem. That happens to be Baltimore. This shows you sort of on a world scale. Um, in Los Angeles, there are seven million containers a year that pass through Los Angeles. Uh, 10, 10 million in uh, North Korea, 11 million in China, and so forth. The numbers here are huge. And we are concerned about the potential that there is some radioactive source or weapon inside any one of those containers. And once you have an event at any port in the world, you will cause huge economic problems every, at every other port because nobody wants this to happen a second time. Fortunately, it hasn't happened the first time. So here's the US. Each of these dots represents a legal point of entry into the United States. On the northern border here, we have all the northern border sites, a whole bunch here in Washington state. Uh, on the southern border down here, on the seaports, all the purple are, are seaports. You notice that there are seaports in Iowa. That's because the Mississippi River transports stuff up there and things don't clear customs till they get to Iowa or wherever. So in, the interior of the US has lots of seaports in it. Uh, the yellow ones are airports where you get obviously luggage and passengers and air cargo and mail and so forth. So there's a lot of places here. In fact, there are uh, 620 uh, such points. Our goal is to somehow protect all of those legal entry points from the transport of an illegal radioactive source that is a potential danger. Now, I'm not going to be talking about all the gaps in between the legal ports of entry. That's not a problem I'm talking about. I'm only talking about the standard ports of entry today because that's a harder problem. So let me say something about radiation detection. I mean, you all are pretty familiar, I would assume, with the idea that Time, distance, and shielding is what determines the det detectability of a source. I want to have a lot of time to make a measurement. I want to be close as possible, and I want to get rid of shielding. Okay. Well, obviously, anybody who's trying to smuggle a radioactive source does not want to give you any of those opportunities. They'll make it hard for you. Uh, we have some source that has some strength to it. It has some energy associated with it. We have some detector geometry, and the, the detectability falls off as 1 over r squared. Uh, you have some detector efficiency, and that detector efficiency may be a few percent at best. Um, shielding is an exponential decay. You know, it, more shielding I add, the, the, it goes up exponentially in terms of the shielding effects. Uh, there's some background radiation, which, which we'll talk about, that's ever present. And you have some amount of time for detection. And then, fortunately, we have experts involved, because the human factors here are exceedingly important. What really makes a difference at a border crossing is the fact that there are customs officers there who can interact with people, because that's really the way that most things are interdicted at borders. So for gamma rays, <coughs> gamma rays um, are photons emitted by the nucleus. They're detected by a variety of different detectors. Um, they typically have unique energies, although not always. Uh, there's various backgrounds, which I'll talk some more about. But environmentally, uh, the sources of the background are mostly potassium and the uranium and thorium chain of reactions uh, that generate background. There are also cosmic rays, which uh, you have to worry about, particularly for neutrons. And then there are things like radon that come out of the soil. Um, what's shown here is a, a PVT, a polyvinyl toluene plastic scintillator. It's a very common, very cheap, very robust gamma ray detector. It gives you very little information about energy, but it's a very good, efficient detector of, of gamma rays. Um, one of the things uh, that happens is that 
photons come into this material and scatter around. It's, it's rare that a photon interacts with a pure photoelectric effect and gives you a single event. Rather, a photon comes in, it's Compton scatters, it goes along somewhere else, it Compton scatters again, you know, it rattles around, it might pair produce, and ultimately, it'll get it'll photoelectric effect and, and get captured. So you may or may not see the total energy associated with that photon. In a piece of plastic like this, you generally will not see that, that energy. Uh, and there are various other types of detectors. For example, uh, Calvin Lin here, WSU works on cadmium zinc telluride as a potential detector material. But for large scale deployments, nothing beats plastic. So here's the sort of spectra one gets from cobalt, from, uh, from uh, gamma ray sources. Th these are all detected in what's called a high purity germanium detector. It's a good, a good high resolution detector. So on each of these, there's an energy scale going across the bottom. The energies we're talking about for nuclear physics are you know, in the MeV range, one to two MeV of energy. Uh, what you'll notice here is these spectra have a lot of lines in them. They're very complicated um, in general. There are some industrial sources like cobalt-60, which have two nice narrow lines. All this other structure here, this is the actual nuclear gamma lines. All this other stuff here is, is various interaction processes in the detector, mostly Compton scattering. Okay. Sort of undesirable, but it's the way it exists. Plutonium has a bunch of lines that are 400 keV or so. Otherwise, it's got a lot of stuff in it. Uranium is even worse. It only has prominent lines around 185 keV. Uh, uranium is more difficult to detect than plutonium, which is more difficult to detect than cobalt, for example. Meanwhile, you have background radiation. And background has got a whole lot of stuff in it. Okay, so you need to pull out a source that might be a pretty weak source of this stuff amongst all that stuff. And it's a tough job in general. Um, so neutron detection. In general, for th these applications, we want to detect both gamma rays and neutrons. We want to detect the gamma rays because everything radioactive emits gamma rays. We want to detect neutrons because plutonium, which is a special nuclear material, emits neutrons in large quantities. Uranium emits neutrons, but not in detectable quantities. You know, the, the, just the spontaneous neutron fission rate or fission rate in, in uranium is very low, so you don't get many neutrons. The typical detector is a a proportional counter. Uh, hopefully you maybe you had some experience with those in the laboratory. But a proportional counter and, and it's inside some sort of moderator. The moderator is there because these proportional counters, this one can, these contain helium-3, the most common neutron detector gas, uh, can only detect thermal neutrons. That is neutrons that have been slowed down to thermal energies. And they capture on helium and give you a detectable signal. So you need to surround this detector with a moderator that slows down the neutrons. Okay, overall, that makes the efficiency of the detectors pretty low because the, you've got to first slow a neutron down without losing it and then detect it. Uh, backgrounds for neutrons, though, are much, much lower than they are for gamma rays, about 1,000 times lower event rates. So, you had a question? Specific to plutonium-239. Um, no, it's actually like plutonium-240 also gives you yeah, significant neutrons. All, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are other detector uh, materials besides helium, and I'll, I'll talk about helium a little bit later uh, because it's an issue. Uh, for example, there's lithium loaded glass, there's um, uh, zinc sulfide coated fibers, there are other ways of detecting neutrons, but helium 3 is sort of the, the best there is. So let me talk now about interdiction. What we have in an interdiction situation is a layered approach. That is, just like everything else at a border, um, you go through a process for detection, and we have different tools available. Uh, there are handheld radiation detectors. There are belt-worn radiation detectors. There are these large portals. Now, I'm going to show you some more pictures. These are radiation portal monitors. They contain large plastic scintillators and large neutron detectors, and they are the workhorse for screening at borders. These are handheld detectors and these are pagers. These are all brought to bear here. Uh, in addition, we have the possibility of x-ray imaging to get a, an image of the inside of a container looking for uh, shielding, for example. And I'll show you an example of that. But just to put this in scale, 
Um, there are about 10 to the ninth bags per year that go through airports. If you have a one in a thousand false alarm rate, which is not bad actually, you're gonna have a million bags you've gotta check for radiation or you know, open up or something. I mean, that's, that's a general problem with any detection technology. Getting a part in a thousand you know, false alarm rate is, is hard to do. And that generally puts a big, a big load on uh, the system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So portal monitors, here's another example. This happens to be in New York. These are radiation portal monitors, large radiation detectors, both gamma rays and neutrons. And there's a, a vehicle, a truck coming through these portals. Um, if you go to the northern border here in Washington State, you go to Blaine or Sioux Mass or Rainbow or any of the other places on the northern border, you will pass through portals like this. So just look for the big yellow things coming into the U.S. Um, these, these systems are very effective for what they're intended to do. They're very sensitive, and they're actually relatively economical to deploy. Okay. Um, you'd be surprised at how inexpensive they are, really, compared to some other technologies. And uh, you know, maybe you'll ask me a question about some of the things that have been in the news related to this sort of stuff, and I can respond to it. So what happens at a border crossing is you go through a detection phase. So a vehicle, for example, passes through a portal monitor. If there's an indication of radiation, it passes to secondary. That's always the process that goes on at a border. If you go through the border, the guy that you first meet there asks you for some credentials, and you know, that's all they do. They don't do anything else in order to keep the, the flow of commerce. If they have a problem, they say, go over there, go to secondary. Okay? In secondary, you go through a similar process, another portal, another interaction with the customs officer, and if they again find a source, they confirm the presence of it, then they would isolate you, follow up with some sort of identification of what that is. They might even open up your, your vehicle, uh, and then you know, they'll either release you or take you into custody. So that's a pretty simple concept of operations uh, that applies to radiation detection. Here's some examples of deployments. Um, the, I, you know, I haven't said yet, but I will, um, that we have been deploying, we, PNNL, have been deploying equipment for the Customs and Border Protection for the last eight years. 98% uh, of all vehicle traffic and cargo is now screened for radiation on entering the United States. You probably didn't realize that, but it's almost everything. This is a, a truck crossing, obviously, another truck crossing, all sorts of weather conditions. These things have to work at 20 below and uh, you know, 120 above. Um, uh, this is a package facility, uh, so, you know, an express courier like FedEx type of, type of deployment. Uh, airports, where you can screen air cargo. Uh, mobile systems that are used for various applications, uh, package screening systems. Uh, that's San Ysidro crossing near San Diego, uh, California. 32 lanes of traffic. It's, I don't know if you've ever been in, how many have ever been through San Ysidro? Anybody? You, it, you have to spend many hours standing in this line. It's a, they're, they're hawkers that run through the traffic and sell you stuff while you're waiting in line. Anyway, that's the type of challenge, engineering challenge we had in terms of deploying this equipment. Now, I mentioned that um, imaging, X-ray imaging, is used routinely as a complement to radiation detection. If you want to avoid detection of radiation, you put some shield around it. But if you put a shield around it, that becomes detectable as a shield in a radiation, in an X-ray imaging type of system. And uh, these are the type of X-ray imaging systems used. This is, that's a truck there with a boom on it. Uh, that one has an accelerator inside of it. Uh, that generates gamma rays, Bremsstrahlung, for imaging that, that vehicle. Uh, here are some examples of, of images. When I first saw that image, I thought those were mannequins. That is not. Those are people crossing the Mexican border. So that's the type of image you can get out of these systems. And um, the amount of imaging that's occurring at borders is increasing because it is a very powerful tool. Uh, more penetrating, you know, x-rays in general. I mean, there are, there are betatrons also used 
but in general, these energies are up in the 3 MeV or to 6 MeV range. Although some, well, some of the systems are down at 200 keV. I mean, there are, there are different types of systems that are used. So let me, let me talk about some of the, the physics issues we run across, because there's an awful lot of stuff happening here, and you want to make these systems as effective as possible. So here's an example. This is a seven or eight hour period following the signal coming out of a portal monitor. And there are several things to notice here. First, about 3,000 counts per second. That's the gamma ray event rate. There's a lot of background. It's all coming from natural sources. That background rate starts out up here at 3,500. Six or seven or eight hours later, it's down to, what's that, about 3,300 or 3,200. Okay. Over the day, there's been a slow downturn in the amount of natural activity. In fact, if you look at this over a year or over several days, there's actually a diurnal effect on the radiation. It comes from two components. One is the atmosphere breathes as the sun expands it, and, and as that happens, it increases the path length for, for cosmic rays. And the second thing that happens is the, the atmospheric pressure changes, and that draws radon out of the ground. Uh, and you'll see radon spikes, particularly around the time of thunderstorms. You'll see, you can see huge spikes in radon as a low pressure system comes through. So anyway, that's one interesting sort of phenomenon. Every one of these down spikes down here represents a vehicle going through the portal. Uh, it goes down. The reason is, is a vehicle comes in, it blocks the natural background radiation from the detector, right? So you have this what's called shadow shielding uh, effect. So that drives the signal down, and you can see every vehicle. But then every once in a while, you'll see blips that go upwards, and those blips going upwards represent some sort of radioactive material. Now, there's a lot of blips that go upwards in that plot. And there are no threats in that plot. Uh, those are all uh, either medical related, we'll talk about them, or what's called naturally occurring radioactive materials. Okay. So uh, this just demonstrates this, this baseline suppression effect. When a vehicle comes through a portal, the baseline, the background rate goes down because that's a great big shield. And if you're looking for a source, just in gross counts, if you just are counting how many counts per second you have there, and you put that onto that baseline suppressed background, you're gonna, if you have a threshold that's up here, you're going to miss that source because of that suppression. So that's a problem. Okay? Well, it turns out there are ways to improve the sensitivity of the system by looking at differential effects, what's called energy windowing. And I think I'll show you an example of that later. So, but that's the that's type of challenge that requires new algorithms in order to be able to do an optimal detection approach. Um, here are some examples of signals that come out of a portal. The top one here uh, shows a gamma ray and a neutron source at the same time. This is in tenths of a second, so that's four and a half seconds right there as this vehicle went through. This was a very large source, and it had both neutrons and gamma rays. Well, it turns out that it's nuclear fuel. Nuclear fuel is that there's enough uranium there that you get a neutron signal out of it. There are also these interesting events. Here's another one. The gamma ray signal here actually drips down a little bit. There's a slight amount of background suppression. But the neutron signal shows this blip here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the source of that blip. That blip comes from what's called the ship effect. And the history of the ship effect is that, um, has anybody ever heard of the ship effect? Any of you? OK. During the Cold War, the US sent out um, boats to intercept Soviet boats looking for nuclear weapons. Okay. Uh, they were going to look for the neutron signal that could come from the plutonium in the nuclear weapons. And what they found is every boat they went up to had a neutron signal associated with it. Well, that raised some concerns that every single Soviet vessel was carrying a, a nuclear weapon. But in fact, of course, it wasn't true. What's happening is that cosmic rays are cascading through the atmosphere. They're producing secondary neutrons. So there are large neutron cascades coming through the atmosphere. Those neutrons interact with the iron in the ship and spallate nuclei, throwing out large numbers of neutrons. So any large mass of material, heavy material like um, lead or copper or steel, will give you a neutron signal. And that's called the ship effect. So, 
Uh, in fact, here's a, here's a picture taken. This is a, this is a small neutron detector. The neutron detector itself is that yellow square, or is, is behind that yellow square. And right behind that is a box of lead bricks. Lead being, you know, so there's a lot of mass sitting there. And this is the signal at the bottom that was observed for one event. Every one of these upticks here, that one, that one, and that one, are neutrons being detected. Well, the time scale here is, that's 26 microseconds. So in 26 microseconds, three neutrons were observed in that geometry. In order to observe those three neutrons in that short time period, there were, that men, means there were 20 or 30 neutrons generated in that pile of lead bricks in order to generate, to be detected as three events in this detector. Okay. That's an example of a ship effect event. I think it's cute, I don't know. Okay, so natural occurring radioactive material. Natural occurring radioactive material is all around you. It's the uranium chain, the thorium chain, and potassium-40. You know, we are all radioactive. We're all the byproducts of, of supernova. And uh, there's lots of uranium and thorium generated there, and potassium-40, and it gets into us through the food chain. Um, and, um, and then, of course, it's in the soil and dirt and everything around us. In addition to uh, that norm, there are commercial sources that are in commerce all the time for medical per reasons, uh, for uh, fire, uh, you know, uh, smoke detectors, all sorts of places. And then there are medical radioisotopes. There are people who receive medical radioisotopes as cancer therapy, but there are also a lot of people who get dosed for uh, stress tests. So technetium-99 is injected into people when they do heart stress tests. And it turns out, and that's actually 90% or so of the medical procedures that involve radioisotopes in the US. One in 2,600 Americans carries a radiation burden from either a cancer therapy or a, or a, or a stress test. So you know, here at campus, you've got 26,000 students, something like that. So you've got at least 10 people walking around this campus that are carrying a medical burden at any time of radiation. At San Ysidro, I mentioned, where all those cars were lined up, there are 50,000 people a day that go across that border. Okay? So 50,000 divided by 2,600 is 20. Okay, so there's 20 alarms a day that have to be gone to secondary, checked to make sure, gee, it's in their thyroid, it's, you know, it's in their body somewhere, it's not in their trunk. Okay, so that produces a, a burden. Um, so here's some examples of uh, nuisance alarms. There are very few neutron sources in commerce. I mentioned um, nuclear fuel, that also yellow cake, which is the uranium uh, oxide that is used for making nuclear fuel. You know, in, um, in Richland, Washington, we have Areva that makes nuclear fuel, right? There's a lot of uranium that comes in the US from Canada and Australia that goes to Areva and they make nuclear fuel out of it and then it's shipped back to other places. Um, there are these well logging sources that cross the northern border particularly all the time because they're looking for natural gas or oil. Uh, there's the ship effect I mentioned. But there are also these things called Troxler gauges. This is a Troxler gauge. These are things that get thrown in the back of pickup trucks. They contain cesium-137 sources and an ambi neutron source. Um, a lot of people who are using these things don't realize they are radioactive. Um, but they're used for measuring soil density. So you actually make a hole in the ground, you stick the source in it, you measure soil density. And, and dryness of cement. So you put it on top to measure the dryness of cement by looking for neutron scattering off the cement. So these things are fairly common. And like I said, they get thrown in the back of pickup trucks and go across the border. Now for gamma rays, there are many, many more sources than there are for neutrons. Uh, you know, there's a long list here. Uh, agricultural products fertilizer. There, in fact, there's a huge surge of fertilizer in the springtime coming out of Canada going to the US to green up all of our golf, golf courses. Uh, in the wintertime, there's a whole lot of salt going across the border to, to throw on the highways, uh, which contains potassium-40. Uh, propane tanks. Uh, there's a lot of radon when they pump gas, natural gas out of the ground. There's a lot of radon in there. And that uh, is enough to be detected. Uh, welding rods. Uh, uh, we've seen air, aircraft parts that are welded 
Uh, some automobiles use highly thoriated welding rods. Uh, so they, they can produce alarms. Television sets. Um, ceramics uh, of all kinds coming across the, the southern border, particularly a lot of you know, pots, uh, ceramics of various kinds. And not bananas. Bananas do not produce radiation alarms. In fact, basic, almost no food product produces radiation alarms. Yes, it contains potassium-40, but the packing density is nowhere near high enough to produce a radiation alarm. So if, if you ever read a newspaper and you read an article about radiation detection at border and they blah, 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 yes, and alarms are produced by kitty litter and bananas. Well, kitty litter, yes. We import huge quantities of kitty litter from Canada, and it's just dirt, and it's radioactive. Bananas, no. They haven't done their homework if they mention bananas. So remember that. It's a pet peeve of mine. OK, so here's some examples of, of alarms that occurred at, at three different border crossings. Um, uh, the first one, for example, kitty litter. 34% of all the alarms at that border crossing were caused by kitty litter. Okay. I, went to, I was over in, in Italy. It is, Potassium, uranium, thorium, it's clay. It's just sedimentary stuff. Yeah. Um, I was in Italy at ISPRA, and we were doing testing for the IEA. And I said to the guy, well, you know, we have this problem with kitty litter. You know, do you have that problem? And can you go out and get some kitty litter so we can test it? And he didn't know what I'm talking about. It turns out, I don't know, Italian cats don't use kitty litter. <laughs> he finally he went around and he scoured various grocery stores, and he finally came up with a bag about that big. You know, we buy it at Costco in the 50-gallon drum, right? That's all he could find. Um, OK, so medical sources produced 16% of alarms there. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, fertilizer, potash, basically dirt of any kind produces an alarm. And then you'll notice that uh, this one particular border crossing, uh, gas tankers, smoke detectors, and television sets. Okay, it's actually the glass in the television sets that produces alarm. And I don't know about the new, you know, the plasma LED sets. I don't know if they have glass on them even. But regular television sets produce alarms. So let me say something about innocent alarms. Innocent alarms are things that you don't care about, but they are truly radiation. So they're not false alarms because they actually are radioactive, but we don't care about them. So... Um, Innocent alarm rates, you know, for cargo, it's about one in 100 vehicles produce an innocent, innocent alarm. It's almost all norm. They're carrying granite slabs or kitty litter. Mail and packages, like one in 10,000, it's very rare. Uh, things like watches that have radium dials on it, things like that are shipped through the mail that sometimes cause alarms. Automobiles, about one in 2,600. Same thing for people, it's the medical alarms that occur for people. Um, if you think of this in terms of alarms, at a container port, you know, there's 15 million containers a year. You're going to get 400 alarms per day out of these ports. I mean, large quantities. This is a large investment in human capital to deal with mitigating the secondary, things like that. Uh, in the channel, uh, they were talking about instrumenting the channel, but you know, they would have uh, something 30, 35 from cargo and two from vehicles per day in the channel, and that's logistically difficult. It's difficult to stop a train. So I wanted to, I wanted to talk about another physics problem. Um, I, I told you that helium-3 is used as a neutron detector material. It works by capturing a neutron that's been thermalized, and it then uh, emits a triton and a proton. And that, that, those energetic particles are then detected in a proportional counter. Uh, it's a very good uh, detector material. Unfortunately, we have run out of helium-3. Um, there's, there's been a large demand for it, both from, from sca neutron scattering science, the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge, for example, and worldwide. They use these detectors, but Homeland Security has been using a lot of this stuff. Uh, we've deployed now over 1,200 of these portals around the US. So we've used a lot of this gas. Um, Helium-3 comes solely from the decay of tritium. Uh, there is a very small amount of helium-3 isotopically found in natural helium. It's about part per million. All the helium in the, in the world pretty much comes out of gas wells. 
and most of it comes out of gas wells in Texas. Okay? But getting a part per million out of that helium is, has been impractical. Um, you can also, in principle, mine the moon because the, uh, the solar wind is highly enriched in helium-3 relative to helium-4 for some reason. Um, in fact, if you saw the movie Moon recently, anybody see the movie Moon? The reason they were on the moon was they were mining helium-3. Uh, in 2001, A Space Odyssey, yeah, anybody see that? Okay. The reason they found the monolith on the moon, they were mining helium-3. Anyway, <clears throat> helium-3 comes from tritium. Tritium was produced for the weapons program by the U.S. and the Russians, and uh, that is no longer happening. It hasn't happened for the last 15 years. Helium-3 is running out, so we're, we're almost uh, out of it. We have to find a solution. So, in fact, this has become a very significant problem, and it finally hit the newspapers last week. New York Times had an article about it. It was in Physics Today a couple weeks before that. Um, so, this is a problem we're working on. Um, in, so, here's some examples of the technologies we're looking at to, for testing. This is a, a detector. The detector is actually in that part in there. That's uh, a, a plastic light guide fiber, wavelength shifting fiber, coated with zinc sulfide mixed with lithium-6. The lithium-6 is the neutron detecting material. The zinc sulfide scintillates. Uh, when the lithium and neutron uh, capture and then break apart. And then the, the waveguide carries it to phototubes for detection. So this is a, a new technology possible replacement for um, uh, helium-3 counters. Some of the other things that we've looked at are uh, boron trifluoride is a possible gas to replace helium-3 as a gas, but it happens to be very toxic. It turns to hydrofluoric acid if it's exposed to va water vapor in the air. So it's got some problems. Um, there are also some, some glass-loaded fibers that have been tested. I don't know if I show a picture of that. I guess I don't. Um, at PNNL, we have a test facility. Uh, that's a schematic of it there. We have a bunch of portals lined up that we drive trucks through and sources through and so forth. So if you ever make it over to PNNL or work there as a summer student, um, we hire lots of summer students, by the way. Uh, so you should all apply. Um, but that's, that's a test facility where we do a lot of testing of these systems. And here's, here's just some, some various test scenarios that we've been running through because we've been looking at these alternatives for neutron detection. Another problem, skyshine. Skyshine is the fact that if you have a large radioactive source, that's, you, may, you may shield that source around the sides, but typically you don't, they don't bother shielding it from the, the air. So the, the, the source shines up into the sky, and then the photons back, bounce around and come back down to the ground again. Now, if, you, if you're building a nuclear power plant, you have to show that you've protected the, the, the human population from sky shine, and you do that by building entertainment around the thing. If you're burying nuclear waste, you again have to show that you've protected against sky shine. But the instruments we're deploying are far more sensitive than people are. And skyshine shows up as a problem because, it, in particularly seaports, they do a lot of X-ray imaging of pipes, for example, with iridium sources. And these are large sources. They're 100 Curie iridium sources. And they produce interference out to large distances. Large distances, I mean, you know, like 700 meters away, you know, across the freeway, down the street. You know, we see those sources simply from the scattered radiation in the sky. And I have a picture somewhere, I think. Uh, so this does produce an impact. There's an example, OK? So this is an Iridium-192 source. That thing right there is the source. This is the shield for it. That snake, the, the, uh, the source comes in and out of that snake. This is a pipe that they're x-ray imaging. They put a piece of film on top of the pipe. They open the source, leave it open for a minute, close the source, go in, push the source down the tube a little bit, put another film on top repeat, you know, a few hundred times. And they use that to, to image the weld that they put onto that pipe there. And then they go back and they fix the weld. So that type of radiography goes on all the time. And those sources in those positions cause interference for our, our problems, so for our, for our detection. So we've had to work at trying to solve that problem. 
So let me talk a little bit about solutions in the last five minutes. Um, that is right, five minutes. Yeah. Um, one of the problems I talked about was shadow shielding. Another one is the fact that naturally occurring radioactive material produces an awful lot of alarms. Wouldn't it be nice if I could discriminate against naturally occurring radioactive material but still detect things I'm interested in, like uranium and plutonium? Okay. So there are approaches to that, that is algorithms that have been developed to work even with plastic scintillator that has very poor resolution. Um, and these, these approaches are called energy windowing. And uh, in fact, it, it does allow us to do a pretty good job of discriminating between natural occurring radioactive material and, and uh, uh, materials of interest. This allows us to increase our sensitivity to these special nuclear materials without increasing our number of alarms. Uh, here's an example of how this works. In the plot here, there are two curves. The, there are actually three curves, the black one and the, and the, there's the black one there, the black one there falls down here. Plutonium looks like background out here, but right here it deviates. Right there, there's a small difference between plutonium and, and background. And then here's fertilizer. Fertilizer looks like that. It's sort of the same shape as background, but a little bit higher. If you, t if you take a ratio, if you take the number of counts here and call that the low window, take the number of counts there and call that the high window, and just take a ratio of those two, what you find is that background and fertilizer look about the same, but plutonium looks very different. Okay? So that's a, just a simple example of what's called energy windowing. You know, the simple ratioing approach allows you to pull out the signal that you want to see. And these types of approaches are used as part of the algorithm set for alarms. Um, I, I mentioned background suppression. This shows an example of a naturally occurring radioactive material source coming through a portal. And if you uh, then uh, have a, dense car a, a, a truck with dense cargo, you get a suppression. So here's a signal and here's the suppression. If you do this ratioing I mentioned a minute ago, this signal is flat, even though there's a big norm signal there. So in effect, you've canceled out the naturally occurring radioactive material signal. You can now see a plutonium signal on top of that signal there if it were present. And the same thing for this background suppression. It's flattened out. You can get rid of the suppression effect. So that's what energy windowing buys you. Now, you may have heard about recent studies dealing with spectroscopic portals and what's referred to as Advanced Spectroscopic Portal Program that the Department of Homeland Security has been running. Uh, this is an example. The idea is that wouldn't it be nice if you could even get better resolution out of these systems than you could discriminate stuff of interest from stuff you aren't interested in? Okay. Well, it was a good goal, but uh, it hasn't worked out that way. I'd be happy to answer questions about that. But the GAO has done a lot of, the General Accountability Office has done a number of reports on this topic and has not been kind to DHS. Um, let's see, I don't have time on that. So let me just say something about active techniques. There's another, yet another technology that could be used. That technology is, suppose I take a photon source and shine it at a piece of, of uh, plutonium. I can cause that plutonium to fission and give back to me gamma rays or neutrons or both. Or I can shine a neutron source on plutonium and cause it to fission and give me back gamma rays and neutrons. That's called active interrogation. There's a number of people who have done research in this. I personally am exceedingly skeptical of it, and I can tell you why if you care. But it is an active area of research that has not yet panned out, but it is a potential technology that's out there. And let me mention one other technology that's out there. Los Alamos has touted what's called muon scattering. In this case, what they're looking for is muons coming through the atmosphere that can scatter off of a very dense piece of material like uranium. And by measuring that scattering, they can localize this inside a container. So these are simulations that show simulate, simulated material inside of a container. Again, it's a nice theory in practice. Uh, it takes too long to do the measurement. It takes several minutes to do a measurement. So it's not a practical primary methodology. So I'm going to close uh, with a couple 
hypotheses and then some conclusions. First one is that currently deployed radiation detection systems, like we've been sh I've been showing you, have really pretty much maximized what can be done with passive screening. It's very hard to do better than what we're doing today with this type of approach. Norm, natural occurring radioactive material, is a limiting factor, but we have found ways to deal with it. So it is not the ultimate limiting factor. On the other hand, medical radionuclides, that one in 2600, is a limiting factor because you always have to be certain it's inside the person, not somewhere else. Okay? So that is actually the limiting rate for what you can do in screening. Uh, spectroscopic portal monitors, uh, at best, they'll be able to do, do better by a factor of two. That's my own opinion. And imaging is crucial. That, that X-ray imaging systems really is complementary and is a very powerful tool. So those are my five hypotheses. One of the things I, I try to communicate to people is that in dealing with a program like this, we have, we have been funded at a very high rate in, over the last seven years. The program has been almost $800 million. It's a lot of money. So there's a lot of politics associated with it. And one of the difficulties we have and one of the difficulties you may have as a physicist is communications. Okay? I like this. I show this in my freshman physics when I do freshman physics. But nobody in the Earl Greeby family knows anything about gravity. Okay? But in general, that's the way I feel about communicating with policymakers. Because it's very hard to communicate with policymakers and get the physics across to them about what matters and what doesn't matter. OK, so um, let me just bring up a couple policy questions. You know, what are the real threats? There's a whole lot of questions that you might ask related to, is this worth it? You know, how much money do you want to spend on it? What about all the other things you're not doing? Those are all great questions. And I may or may not have answers for them. So in conclusion, um, we have technology to, to interdict a large range of nuclear threats. Norm and medical sources are uh, the most significant sources of alarms at borders. Neutron detection and gamma ray detection and imaging are all complementary, and that's why we use them all. Uh, technology improvements may only marginally enhance what we are doing today. We can't get a lot, whole lot out of it without a new approach. And uh, so uh, an awful lot has been accomplished in the last eight years. Uh, we're not done yet, though. And of course, there are all the tasks that we haven't even tackled yet. So any questions? Uh, yeah, there, there are some efforts for doing interdiction. Uh, there are various programs that have been done for interdiction circling certain cities around like New York City uh, on certain major highways like some of the major highways going through the eastern U.S. Uh, they're at truck stops, for example. So there are some programs, but it's a very, you know, you're talking about a very expensive problem uh, to deal with. So... Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what's been done. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned you're going to run on a helium-3. Is that because you need to build new detectors or because the existing ones are going to deplete the helium in a reasonable time? Or no, fortunately, the, the helium, it'll last for 20 years. I mean, okay. yeah. Uh, and it's, it's continued deployment. So what's the replacement? How much is it linear? Well, uh, the... The problem, okay, gadolinium, what? Gadolinium loaded scintillator, for example. Any bulk, my own opinion, any bulk scintillator can never get a sufficient gamma neutron separation. That is, gamma rays produce a background count rate and pile up of large sources. What you're contending with is the presence, let's say, of a medical source that might hide the presence of a neutron source. So you've got a, you've got a 30 millicurie medical source and there's a few counts two, three, four counts per second of neutrons, a bulk scintillator is never going to separate it. See, helium-3 is totally insensitive to gamma rays, up to rates like up until you get to 100 MR or so. Um, but that's why people have gone to fibers to try and segment this thing so you get much less gamma ray response. But even those can't quite make it. So 
that's been the problem. The problem is getting good neutron efficiency at the same time you get low gamma ray efficiency. Yeah. You said that the, the source, source of it replaced the 50s something in the country. Yeah, the, the, because people got on airplane. They, you know, this they were this guy was out in public and it was tracked from bars and into what places. Makes, yeah. uh, what makes it unique? What makes a, a source unique? Like, like couldn't that have been from some other source? Well, because it was. I mean, it was. De you can detect the pluton polonium and you can determine that it is pol polonium. Um, so they actually tracked the source itself, you know, the material itself. So it could have been somebody else's polonium, yes. But uh, since it seemed to, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it really did spread quite wide. It's amazing. <laughs>